Hello and welcome to the I3P Town Hall meeting. I'm Eldora Valentine, I3P Communications Lead for the program. Today we want to bring awareness to the I3P program. With me today we have our program manager, Gary Cox. And from left to right of Gary, we have Communication Services uh, Service Executive, Tom Miglin. Neil Rogers is representing the Enterprise Application Services area. We have John Sprague with End User Services. And we have Sarab Bavasia with Enterprise uh, Service Desk. And then we have Jackie Gill representing our web services. We also have several of our uh, NASA partners in the audience, so they will be available to participate in today's discussion as well. We'll begin by having Gary Cox give us a brief overview and status of the program. Then we'll take questions, starting with our Wave 1 centers. Each center will be allowed to ask two questions, and then we'll move on to the next center, and so on and so on so that that way every center has an opportunity to ask questions and then we'll repeat the order. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gary Cox. Thank you, Eldora, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for showing up today. Certainly a great crowd here at headquarters. I appreciate you coming. Um, as uh, we were getting ready to go on air, I heard the announcement about silencing your, your BlackBerry uh, so as not to cause any interference, and, and I thought, you know, if we had done this Wednesday, you wouldn't have had to do that, right? Um, and it, quite an ordeal there, but it brings to mind just how important IT's become to us, um, just something as, as simple as, as email, and how many things have to go right to bring that, uh, you know, to the masses. And it's a responsibility we certainly take very seriously uh, with this program, and uh, certainly in, endeavor to uh, do our best to, to bring quality services to, uh, to NASA. So we get into the uh, slides, I'll spend a few minutes talking about the uh, IT infrastructure integration program and then uh, open it up for questions. Uh, next slide. So what is I3P? Well, in a nutshell, it's an integrated set of, of services that the NASA mission and mission support organizations need to do their, their jobs, whether it's you know, mission related or you know, business admin, uh, whatever. It's the the end user services, as we call them, the, uh, the desktops, laptops, cell phones, uh, PDAs, uh, you know, multifunction devices, you know, printers, copiers, et cetera, uh, all the way through the, uh, the network, voice, video, uh, data communications, both uh, mission and, and corporate. Uh, it's the web services. Our, our uh, NASA portal is recognized as one of the best in, in uh, the world certainly in all of government, and, uh, you know, we'd like to, to keep leveraging that uh, to bring the, uh, the mission of NASA to the masses. And then the enterprise applications that we rely on every day for finance, procurement, logistics, uh, you know, goes, goes on and on, travel, et cetera. So uh, we're, we're trying to bring those together to, to you folks in an integrated way and, and service that through an enterprise service desk that provides uh, a high level of, of uh, you know, first call resolution, uh, you know, tier zero and tier one support, and then, then pass that on to uh, the vendors who uh, we expect to respond uh, promptly to, to any problems. This is about $300 million a year worth of, of services, so uh, certainly, uh, you know, it gets everybody's attention, uh, not only in our office, but, you know, at the administrator's level and, and out at all of the centers. And, and as I said, we take it very seriously. Next slide. So some of the major components of I3P, I mean, there's been various projects that we've, we've run, like upgrading the wide area network and implementing smart cards and, and working on single uh, sign-on and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, the, the four largest components of this are, are the ACES contract, the East contract, NICS, and West. ACES is the Agency Consolidated End User Services contract that's been awarded to Hewlett Packard Enterprise Services. Um, I'm glad that uh, the senior team from HP is here today and, and uh, they'll be available after the event for folks to meet. Certainly, uh, you know, that's over a billion dollars worth of potential business over 10 years uh, for them. They're taking this very seriously. Uh, 
Robert Pearson is the, uh, the program manager for HP, and that uh, set of services being managed out of the NASA Shared Services Center uh, right now, currently by Jim Walker at the, uh, the NSSC. Uh, EAST is the Enterprise Application Services and Technologies contract. that has been awarded to SAIC. Uh, Sue Myers from SAIC is here with us today. She's the, uh, the contractor PM. And of course, uh, you know, down at the NSSC, Neil Rogers and, and uh, Amy Stapleton and folks are, are supporting that. Uh, you know, a, again, uh, those are all of the uh, applications that were brought up as IEMP. And, uh, you know, now we call that, uh, you know, the NEAC, the NASA Enterprise Application Competency Center down there at Marshall. Uh, for NICS, the NASA Integrated Communication Services contract, you know, uh, SAIC uh, got that award uh, that's being managed by uh, Dan Harris of SAIC. And uh, we kind of have a, uh, a mixed uh, service office there. Uh, uh, Marshall uh, is the main uh, program office or, or service office there, but it's supported by Goddard for the mission uh, uh, wide area network. And then uh, Ames provides technical uh, technology support uh, to that service office. Uh, for West, uh, you know, I had a better story uh, last week. This week the story is uh, we had to cancel that procurement. Unfortunately, uh, you know, some requirements have changed and we had some, some issues there after several uh, years of, of work on that. But we're, uh, you know, we've got plans in, in place to rapidly recover uh, certainly, we're going to make sure that those services uh, under the NASA portal are sustained and, and while we uh, develop the, the new uh, procurement strategy. So, you know, that, that will take a few uh, months probably, and you'll be hearing more about West in the future. Uh, the Enterprise Service Desk down at uh, the NSSC, uh, CSC is supporting the NSSC, and, and they've been hard at work standing up the uh, not only the service desk, but an enterprise service request system uh, that folks would be able to access uh, via web, uh, phone, and, and any other means that are uh, reasonably available. Uh, you know, our, our intent there is, is to grow and, and keep improving on an uh, enterprise service desk that will serve NASA well into the future and not walk out the door you know, every you know, five to ten years as contractors change. So, uh, you know, we're hoping that it's a great experience when we, we stand it up and we want it to, to get better and better every year. And then the consolidated business office at the NSSC, rather than have every center, uh, you know, stand up duplicate functions of contracting officers and, and uh, resource analysts uh, and whatnot, uh, we've consolidated those functions down at the NSSC. So they'll be doing contract administration, putting funding on the contract, uh, you know, working with the centers on, on bills, monitoring contract performance, uh, or doing some of the reporting. Obviously, the, the technical folks would be out at the centers working with the contractors on, on the, uh, the technical aspects. But the business piece of it will be uh, handled by the NSSC. Next slide. So why are we doing I3P? Well, there's probably lots of, of, of reasons be, besides the four I have here, but the four biggest ones uh, you know, three or four years ago, NASA and OMB conducted uh, some studies on how much agencies were spending on uh, IT and IT infrastructure. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, at that time, NASA was uh, reporting about $2.2 .2 billion in IT spend, and about uh, seven to $800 million of that was in IT infrastructure. So uh, it represents a... a you know, a, a target opportunity for us to, to go out and, and do some rearrangement of requirements, take advantage of market conditions and competition in order to reduce our cost, which in these austere times, I think everybody would agree is uh, welcome. Uh, uh, also at that time, the Constellation program was, uh, was gearing up and uh, spreading work packages across the agency. And on a program of that magnitude with uh, the work spread out, you needed an integrated infrastructure that would support uh, a, you know, a program spread out across the agency in terms of you know, uh, 
folks being able to get the information, uh, share the information, and, and, uh, and integrate, et cetera. So uh, the, the intent of I3P is to facilitate that, even though uh, you know, we've moved on from Constellation to SLS and other endeavors, certainly uh, no less important uh, today than it was three years ago. Uh, from a security perspective, up until recently, NASA was uh, considered a material weakness, uh, reported that way, uh, you know, to Congress, et cetera. We got a lot of attention for that. We still get a lot of attention for it. And we've tried to structure the program and uh, these contracts to help us uh, put together a, a solid IT infrastructure and processes uh, to protect the agency's uh, information. And finally, you know, and perhaps this, this should be the first bullet, but we want to enhance the customer experience. Uh, you know, I'm as frustrated as anyone you know, when you come in in the morning and it takes you 20 minutes to fire up the computer and get your email downloaded, and that's probably if you're lucky. Um, and so, you know, that's, uh, you know, it, it takes an integrated approach because it's not just the desktop and it's not just the client and it's not just the network. It's, you know, the combination of all of the components that lead to, you know, these, uh, these experiences like the, uh, the, you know, calendar problems that a lot of people are experiencing. And so uh, over the course of, you know, the next year or 10 years or however long it takes, we're going to uh, improve that customer experience. Next slide. So, uh, you know, there's probably... Uh, not enough time and uh, enough slides to, to fully describe what it means to you. So I'll just try to touch on some of the big things. Relative to ACES, we've been in uh, a mode of suspension of the, the refreshes uh, for the hardware for quite some time as Odin was ending and we knew the new contract was coming. And so at the very least, desktop refreshes are going to resume. Now, I'm sure the, the question that everybody, the first question that would probably be asked unless I, I head it off is, when is that going to happen and, and, and uh, how rapid is, is the deployment uh, going to be? And all I can say at this time is we're, uh, NASA and HP are working uh, together to try to uh, put together a solid schedule and, uh, you know, not only for when we're going to start doing the refreshes, but uh, you know how swiftly they'll um, they'll be undertaken, and as soon as that information's available, you know we're uh, going to get that out to the centers and, and get it out to folks. But uh, you, you know you should probably at least plan on uh, you know when Odin ends and HP starts providing service at your center, it's going to be uh, on your existing Odin equipment. Uh, relative to NICS, uh, about half of the centers use ODIN for their uh, network services as part of the, the seat at um, several centers. And terminology that we had to learn, you know, 10 to 12 years ago, like NADs and LAN A's and LAN B's and, and things like that to order services are, is going away. We're going to a, a much simpler uh, set of services, you know, like I need a network drop and uh, and you'll be getting that. So um, I think that's actually going to be uh, quite an improvement, but it's going to be an adjustment for some of the centers that have been operating differently for a while. Uh, for West, uh, at, at some point, we're going to uh, pull together a new contract. Uh, the, the biggest thing we need, need to do there is, is put a, a customer-friendly uh, content management system in place. The reason a lot of folks don't uh, haven't migrated their, their web uh, public web uh, instances to the uh, the portal is because of the uh, content management system we currently have there and and so once we get a new contract in place and a new CMS and services that that folks want uh, we certainly expect to get a lot of the uh, public web content uh, out of the center environment and get it, get it into an enterprise uh, managed in, environment that uh, it will improve its exposure, the exposure of the information to the public, and as well as uh, security. Uh, for ESD, there's going to be one number to call. Now, you know, as we go through this transition, most centers are, are probably going to do things a little bit uh, differently. So uh, I, I can't speak for any one particular center, but most likely here at headquarters, you know, we call help 
uh, H-E-L-P, and, uh, you know, we, we get the call tree. So for, uh, you know, IT, we'll hit the, uh, I think it's a one, and, and then, you know, it'll go through. But it's going to get routed to the uh, Enterprise Service Desk at uh, the Shared Services Center, and they're going to uh, do some triage on your, on your call, try to give you first call uh, resolution if possible. If not, they'll pass it down the line to the uh, appropriate vendor to, to fix your problem. And then with the consolidated business office, uh, I think the biggest thing uh, the, the user community will see is just standard funding processes and reports on uh, you know, the usage uh, and charges for, for IT. So we're, we're trying to make that much simpler. And uh, we've been working some things with OMB and, and the Hill uh, and the Working Capital Fund uh, you know, that will cross our fingers and, and hope go through that, that will significantly reduce the uh, level of effort required there. So we'll go to the next slide. So some of the uh, milestones, uh, the Consolidated Business Office actually uh, started up October 1st, and uh, the, uh, actually someone from the NSSC drove up to uh, the NEAC in Huntsville and picked up the boxes full of the uh, contract files and hauled them back, back down to the NSSC. So that transition uh, of the East contract to the, uh, the consolidated business office has happened, and, and they'll be gearing up to, to start with uh, the ACES uh, contract in November. Uh, we'll be uh, standing up the initial operating capability for the Enterprise Service Desk on November 1st in support of, of ACES and, and uh, the base services under that. Um, certainly appreciate all of the, uh, the folks that have participated in the testing of the Enterprise Service Desk and the service request system uh, thus far, and, and there's still some uh, critical milestones we have to get through in operational readiness reviews, but uh, we, we expect everything to be um, at, at least at a sufficient level of operating capability on November 1st. Uh, for ACES, uh, Wave 1, uh, we're, do, we're doing this in three waves just because, you know, there's 45,000 uh, users there and multiple centers and uh, trying to do it all at once would just be uh, too much. But wave one is Dryden, uh, Goddard, headquarters in Kennedy. Uh, they're going to start, uh, HP is going to start services November 1st. That's when the Odin delivery order ends there. Um, then we're going to be picking up under the, uh, the NICS contract, the uh, local area networks at, at Ames and, and headquarters on December 1st. Uh, for the Wave 2 of ACES, which is Glenn, Stennis, uh, the NSSC, and Marshall, uh, January 1st, uh, uh, we're going to start service there. And then as well, they have um, their local area networks will be coming in, uh, transitioning to NICS at that time. And then with uh, Wave 3, Ames, Langley, and, and JSC, uh, they'll, be, they'll end their ODIN service on March 1st, and HP will pick up services there. And, um, and as well, NICS will pick up the, uh, the local area networks for uh, Langley and JSC at that time. So those are the milestones and just uh, you know, some tidbits about the program. And I'd like to spend the rest of the, the time on uh, any questions that folks may have. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Gary's slides will be available online, so if you miss some of those, we will post those. Um, we were scheduled to go to the Wave 1 centers first, but um, some of them are having some technical di difficulties. So we're going to go ahead and I believe we have a question coming in from Marshall. So go ahead, Marshall. Marshall, can you hear us? Okay. Okay. Uh, do we have someone at headquarters who would like to ask a question then? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, why don't we go ahead and open it up with the first question. Um, some of these were sent in from the centers. Um, one of the questions that came in was who will pay for directly ordered multifunctional device items? So, uh, Gary, if uh, you want to answer that, or the multi multifunction devices falls under the uh, 
the end user services realm and the ACES contract. So I'll let John Sprague uh, answer that one. Thanks, Jerry. Um, if the camera can hit it, uh, there's an MFD right here in the room, multifunctional device. And the, and the question about it is, who, who pays for that? The organization pays for it. Um, and you, and they're, they're positioned where you want in your organization. Um, I know that that's just a slight difference from, from how it was done before. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're going from the Xerox contract to the new contract on, on ACES. And the MFDs will be wherever you want them to be. We did a little bit of uh, preliminary research at the centers and have an idea of where they, they need to be. Uh, you know, better placement, things like that, and that's going to be uh, happening very soon at, at your center. Okay, thanks. We have Johnson Space Center online with the question. Go ahead, Johnson. Yes, I'm asking this on behalf of one of our customers. Will there be any changes to user mailbox size under ACES? Will there still be enhanced mailboxes like one gigabyte, same number, or more? Yeah, again, uh, that falls under end user services. So, John, uh, you're probably going to be the man of the hour. So, <laughs> so uh, th there is going to be no change on the mailboxes at this time. Uh, one of the things that we asked for in the uh, contract was to give us an innovative solution and uh, something that we'll be looking at in the future uh, because I get that request quite often, actually probably about once a month. Uh, from somebody. You know, there's always the emergency, you're, you're TDY somewhere, you're, you're out maybe not even at a center and you can call in and get your, your box bumped up for a little bit if needed. But uh, the, the, the levels are not going to change. You're going to either have 400 megabytes as a standard or the one, uh, the one gig. So uh, it's not going to change anytime soon, uh, but we are looking at it and uh, hope to have something in the, probably in the next couple of years. Uh, where we'll, we'll change the nomad system to uh, be able to accommodate that. Yeah, and that's, that's a case where HP is, is basically coming in and picking up uh, the NASA infrastructure for uh, the, the email. And we recognize, uh, you know, there's a lot of work needed there, and uh, it's probably be one of the, the first things that we'll focus on is improving that, uh, that service. Thank you. Another question. The ACES seats will come with Windows 7. How will smart card pin resets be supported? So pin, pin resets are going to be very similar to the way they're done now. Uh, you know, you, you can call, call in and have it done. Uh, you know, just call the help desk and, and have a, a reset done. So there's going to be really no change in the way it's done. Okay. So what, I think what she was referring to then is... Uh, when we roll out Windows 7, when we start the, the refresh, um, if there's, I, I, I'm assuming that they'll be calling the, the ESD uh, with a, a reset request, and, the, and uh, ideally the ESD would be doing that password reset, right, Sarab? So, so if there's a knowledge article that's present that, that allows for the Tier 1 tech to triage that issue, that is correct. At Tier 1, it would be triaged at that point. Um, however, if there's not a knowledge article, it would be passed forward. Okay, thanks. We have a couple of questions coming in from Goddard. Go ahead, Goddard. So we're still having some technical difficulties. Uh, here's another question that came in. Um, what are East's future plans for mobile applications? Neil? Yes. So Neil, can you... Yeah, there's a lot of excitement in the agency about mobile applications and what they provide in terms of productivity uh, leveraging these devices. So uh, in the uh, Enterprise Application Service Office over the last year or so, you're probably familiar with some of the applications we've developed to kind of uh, explore this, uh, this area, this capability, web tads, mobile, NASA contacts, those are available today. Uh, what we're doing, though, is we've, we've heard from a lot of uh, other people around the agency that there are apps that they want to develop, but they're looking for a uh, kind of a one-stop shop to be able to uh, deploy those applications, make them available for uh, other folks to use, uh, and also uh, uh, if they were developing, could they get uh, have forums where they could share uh, code or, or uh, ask get questions answered, technical uh, questions answered 
to enable them to do that. So what we're standing up, and we've really just uh, turned this capability on uh, this month uh, in terms of a, a, a broader rollout, is uh, apps.nasa.gov. And so this will be uh, a uh, capability uh, app store for internally uh, developed, deployed applications. By internally, I mean uh, uh, for in the intent of consumption by or use of NASA uh, civil servants or contractors. Uh, so uh, you can go to apps.nasa.gov and, uh, and see the uh, applications that are deployed there. And I would encourage you to um, check that frequently. There will be a lot of changes that we hope to start rolling out uh, in collaborations with some centers that were already on their way to having those deployed. So uh, we're really excited about it, and, and hopefully this will provide a, a better uh, opportunity for folks to gain access to these on a number of different platforms. Okay. And thanks, Neil. And, and you know, while we have Neil up here, I, I want to just throw a plug out for the work that they did on single sign-on for Fed Traveler. I, I think uh, if you haven't used it yet, you, you need to. At, at the very least, you don't have to remember your username, um, and so you can go right into Fed Traveler. You still need your PIN in order to approve documents, et cetera. But uh, it is a much improved experience. So, um, thanks, Neil. Okay, I think we have another question coming in from Marshall. So how will the end user know who to call when they have a problem? Yeah, uh, well, that gets back to, to one number to call. It, it, it'll go to the Enterprise Service Desk, and the Enterprise Service Desk will route your call to, you know, whoever uh, is the appropriate person to, to fix it. They're going to try to help you. Um, at the very least, they'll triage and try to find out if it's a, a desktop issue or a network I issue, application, et cetera, and um, they'll work with you to try to get that resolved and, and conduct uh, any warm handoffs from their help desk to the, uh, the Tier 2 help desk in order to uh, you know, make sure that you get back up to, uh, to speed quickly. So at, at your center, uh, you know, depending on how your, your call tree goes, um, you know, you'll, you'll have probably something that leads you down the IT path and, um, and then to get to the ESD and, and then from there to get routed to the appropriate spot. Okay. I think we have one more follow-up question from Marshall. Question. Can someone talk a little bit about the metric that you intend to measure, uh, that you intend to measure success in meeting the goals of I3P? Yeah, well, there's uh, there's a myriad of metrics, and and uh, you know they they go all the way down, you know, multiple levels, uh, you know, down to you know availability of service, customer satisfaction, um, you know, time to return to service, and 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 that all the way up to um, uh, higher level things. Uh, so I mean, we do have uh, uh, metrics. Uh, you know, someone working on the metrics with the, the uh, Shared Services Center, and we'll have a dashboard on that. And, you know, there's not any one metric that's going to be tied to enhancement of the, the user experience. But, you know, there's customer satisfaction metrics all the way through, and, and you know, we've got some baselines there, and, and we'll be looking uh, to make, you know, progress on those baselines. From a security perspective, uh, you know, obviously, security is always hard to um, to get meaningful metrics on. You know, you can always um, you know look at you know intrusions and and uh, you know attacks and and denial of service and the, and those kind of things. Um, but it's it's you know that's probably going to be a little little tougher for us to. Uh, you know, gain some ground on understanding exactly where we are and whether we've uh, made things safer because, you know, it's such a dynamic environment and the, the, uh, the, the threat sources are always changing and the vectors, et cetera. But I mean, we do have a, a fairly robust set of metrics um, and, you know, they're tiered and uh, geared towards uh, answering that question because obviously GAO and the IG and everybody's going to come in and, and ask us if we achieved our goals. So. I think we have a question coming from headquarters. 
Yes, I have a nuts and bolts question about scanning. Uh, uh, let me just explain that uh, my office has two desktop scanners that we use for scanning key documents for the history office. Okay, but uh, our office also uses uh, the Xerox Work Center. Uh, function for scanning at times for small documents. It does an OCR, and no one seems to be able to answer this question, but I, I think it's Konica is replacing these. Do, does that uh, device scan an OCR, first of all? The problem with the Xerox Work Center also, I've heard complaints, is that when you try to scan and place a document on the glass, you have to re-enter your email address each time. So you get one-page PDFs each time. If you put it through the uh, doc a document feeder, it's okay. You know, you get more multi-page. So there, there's some concern about will this device uh, be a step up? You know, to help us uh, rather than spending time, you know, replacing sheets and so forth. And the other thing is, uh, our desktop scanners uh, uh, will no longer be on the Odin contract, although we purchased them. Will they? Disappear? Will they be taken away? Will will we get service? Will we get support on those? And uh, so it's, you know, we're, we're trying to. to it, it also gives a better quality scan than the Xerox Work Center. We're hoping that the Conoco will be a better quality image as well, so that we can use both. Yeah. So, uh, John, I'm not sure if you can answer those kind of details or whether you want to defer to someone from from HP. So, so let me start off with with saying that y you mentioned two different kinds of scanners. You have your your one that maybe is connected to your computer and you, you do scanning there, and that's that's fine. If that's an Odin owned asset, then that's been purchased by is going to be purchased by HP. So that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I already mentioned the MFD that we have down here on the floor. And the OCR that you're talking about is a, is a very good question that I, that I don't personally know the uh, answer to. I don't know if any of our HP folks here know if the MFD can, can also do OCR with it. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure about that. No? Yeah. I, I, and I don't think, I, I know that uh, I helped with the, the contract that I don't remember uh, that little particular uh, part being put in. But that is something we can look at. Um, for the future, uh, you know, we're, we're really, the, the way we wrote this contract, it's, it's set up for innovation. We, we really wrote it in every aspect that, uh, that we could think of. And, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, a very good rep from uh, HP here, Steve Vetter, who's uh, in charge of their innovation area. So that's an area I'll talk to him about and see what we can do in the future. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've got pretty much the whole HP team except for the person that knows about the MFDs and, and copiers, so uh, we'll have to make sure you know we, we get with you personally because you know it sounds like you have a very specialized requirement that we need to to make sure we hit. Many other folks that they're hoping it's you know this is not just just me and, and a couple people that many people in the building use these to scan as attachments to email and they like to have an OCR sometimes they keep a document. Yeah, I mean as as we go through this. Uh, you know, as we find gaps, we're, we're you know, we're going to find them. Uh, you know, the intent here is not to make things go away or to make, make it so that you can't do your job. We're going to find a way to make it so that you can do your job. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a couple of questions coming from uh, Stennis and NSSC are teamed up together. So uh, let's go to Stennis. Thank you. First question is, um, can you describe the differences on the ACES contract between base services and the general services? Additionally, do both of those kinds of services go into effect at the same time, or are those on a different schedule? Yeah, just so, John, if you can, can touch on that. So what, what we've done is uh, on our website that you'll see at the very end of this, uh, the town hall, there's a website that you can go to, and, and in there, you, you can grab uh, or take a look at some facts sheets that we have. And it, it does a really good job of breaking it out. So base services are items like, they're enterprise type items. Uh, your, your nomad system, the email system, NCAD, that's Active Directory, Directory Service, uh, instant messaging, uh, IT security related uh, management, two-factor token, you know, your, your um, RSA tokens, uh, uh, loaner, ma uh, loaner pool management, and print queue infrastructure. Some of those general services that are out there 
our APC, which is the ACES product catalog, where you can go out and get uh, little pieces and parts that you want to get for your machine, for your uh, system. Maybe you want external, uh, an external hard drive or an extra monitor or something like that. Uh, other general services are temporary seats, the, uh, the ACES, Tier 2, Tier 3, service desk, the field support. And then uh, there's something out there called developmental test labs. That's where any user in NASA can go to one of these labs, and it has the images of all these machines on it, all the different uh, the seat types that are out there, the standard premium seat, the, you know, and it has uh, the Apple, you know, it has a Wintel, has all those different, different areas in it. So, so John, uh, base services then, uh, all of those start on November 1st, right? Correct. So for the Wave 1 centers, all, all, all the centers uh, are going to all be able to make their phone calls in and, and get uh, all their equipment taken care of. But uh, base services also starts for all of NASA because NOMAD is used by all the centers, not just the Wave 1 centers, as an example. Yeah, so HP would be taking over the management of the email, uh, the NASA Active Directory, and uh, those other services. That's uh, correct. There, okay. Okay. Any follow-on? No, not, a, not from um, Stennis. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have another one from Stennis. Go ahead, Stennis. Go ahead, Stennis. Uh, we were wondering when uh, software training would be made available for the various uh, uh, ACES softwares, like the operating systems or the productivity suites, and by what methods those courses would be made available. Yeah, again, that's um, John. So another one of the uh, items that we have on the website is a uh, ACES software training guide. Uh, there's lots of different software user guides that are already available that you can just go down and look at and open them up and, and look through them. There's also some Saturn courses out there. They're already out there. Um, getting started with Windows 7, since Windows 7 wasn't fully implemented across all of NASA, um, some people are going to be getting Windows 7 for the first time. So that might be something that you'd want to check out. Uh, so just go to your normal Saturn and, and look for that. Uh, there's, you know, there's Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole slew of them on here. And, and for the Macs, too. Uh, Word for Mac 2011, getting started. And then uh, also something that the HP folks are going to be doing at all the centers is uh, lunch and learn so that uh, you can go and, and actually get, you know, that hands-on, real up-close, personal type of uh, training and learn about one of the new systems, if, there's, if that's a new system to you, uh, you can get that kind of data you need. Okay. Example, Thanks, John. Any, okay. any, Sorry. Anyone from HP want to expand on that? Or? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's uh, go to headquarters. We have another question from our center. Go ahead, headquarters. Good afternoon. Um, I was wondering if we could get clarification on a, uh, I, guess, I think it's a, a governance approval that happened yesterday on the CIO having a funding decision-making authority for physical security and how that impacts the enterprise physical access control system that we use? Yeah, uh, actually, I, I'm not aware of that, uh, that particular decision. So Linda Curitan, thank God, is in the audience. <laughs> So the decision, actually I saw Rick Keegan come in, but uh, Rick Keegan is the uh, chair of the Mission Support Council. The Mission Support Council consists of uh, myself, the CFO, Chris Calise, um, our safety and mission assurance head, Terry Alcott, and Woodrow Whitlow, the head of the Mission Support Directorate, chaired again, like I said, by Rick Keegan. And the decision that was made yesterday was not about control of funding, it was about the uh, how decisions are made in three phases. The first phase is about business systems uh, to the extent that the Office of Physical Security is under the Mission Support Directorate and they provide business solutions for the whole agency. Then the, this new board, which is co-chaired by the Deputy CFO and the Deputy Associate Administrator of the Mission Support Directorate, and it's supported by the CIO and others across the agency, 
this new board would have the purview of strategy and direction for business systems, which include physical security. So um, it's a not control of budget, but it's influence. The control of the budget is under the Mission Support Directorate head, which is there. So he does control his budget, and he is a part of that governance structure. And that was what was decided yesterday. Okay, thanks, Linda. Um, we have two more questions coming from Johnson. Go ahead, Johnson. Yes, this one has multiple parts to it. What happens when a printer or MFD reaches its maximum number of impressions for the month? Will printing stop? Will the printer still print but at an increased cost? What will be the increased cost and how will customers be charged? Okay, that, again, that comes under end user services. So, John, if you could. Yeah, uh, so if a, if a MFD goes over its limit, uh, obviously there's, there's uh, some charges there. But, um, you know, it's not going to stop. The, the printer is going to keep, the uh, MFD is going to keep functioning. Um, we'll just keep track of that. And uh, we do have something in, in the contract where if you go over this month, um, you know, it, it's watched to make sure for the following month. And if it goes over again, then obviously something has to be done. Um, there's also some pooling that is done. Uh, you know, at, at a higher, at a, at some of the higher bands. So, uh, depending on the uh, type of uh, the MFD that you get. So, John, this this is a case, if, if I remember correctly, where uh, the the print uh, the copiers are networked, and so they're they're being watched and, and monitored uh, constantly as far as the number of impressions. So, uh, it's not like we you know get um, you know too far down the road and and you know, folks are, are suddenly surprised with some kind of a, a bill. I, I, I imagine that once they hit, you know, that number of impressions, there's, there's going to be some intervention to just make sure folks are aware of what's going on and, and as you said, watching it, right? Yes, and if you go over your band, uh, you know, several months in a row, then, then it will be suggested that you, that you up the band because there's several bands that you can, you know, different amount of pre impressions that you can do. Uh, as for cost, the organization actually pays for the MFT. It's a seat, just like uh, any of the other seats. So the organization would then uh, have to pay that extra cost. OK, and that's only the first part, I guess, of the question. Yeah, there's another Thank question. You. Yeah. How do we get seats delivered to people who are remotely located or are not at a center? Yeah, John? <laughs> that, that's a good question. Uh, We've been working with the uh, HP folks. They're, they're very well aware that we have seats uh, up in New York at the, the GIS, the GISS facility, um, and, and many other facilities, uh, White Sands and, and other places like that. And uh, in those cases, they're working uh, to either ship those out and have somebody out there to, to meet with them, or uh, they're working it in, in other ways. But they are making sure that all our users out there do get their machines. Uh, if you have a machine now, you're going to have it in the future. And uh, you know, over time, we're expecting to pick up even more of those seats because this contract was written to be able to, to do way more than uh, we've been able to do in the past. You're able to get the kind of seats that you want. So um, you know, I have full confidence that HP is going to get the machine out to wherever that site is. Yeah, and I think beyond, beyond that, um, you know, HP has a presence in almost every state of the, uh, the country of some form or function. And, you know, they have endeavored, if you're on travel to, you know, Idaho and you have a problem with your computer, you know, they'll find a way to get somebody out to, to you to fix, uh, fix your computer. So I think, you know, they're very committed to um, customer service and, um, and, I, and I think they have the infrastructure to, to support that no matter uh, where we are. Maybe even Hawaii, I don't know. That would, that would be nice. I'd like to take that trip just to yeah, find out. I'll go out there. I'll take care of that one. Okay. Okay. We have two questions coming from Goddard. Go ahead, Goddard. Uh, this question is for John. The, the premise of the contract was everyone was going to receive new seats. And, of course, last week we reached an agreement with for HP to acquire all of them seats. That's mean now we're doing a refresh schedule. So the question for you, and it, some users might want to get a new seat, even though they are not due for a refresh yet. 
will they be able to do so? All right, uh, Doctor, I, I know uh, we're, we are getting, uh, we are negotiating right now and, and are uh, very close to being able to finish up with uh, what's going on with the, uh, the Odin seats. So, 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 so is, he, is, he, is he asking about an early refresh? I think that's what he's asking, early refresh. Okay. So for an early refresh, uh, let's say that you've uh, received a computer, you've had it six months, and something, there's something else out there that you'd like or it's not working for you, and you need to refresh that early. Uh, just like under the Odin contract, you're able to do that. But, uh, of course, there's an there's a early refresh calculator that will be able to tell you how much you're going you're gonna to need to pay uh, to get it done early. Because it's really your, your seat's for a three-year period, and in year two, you, you want to refresh one year early, you're going to need to pay that difference. And then you'll be able to get your new seat early. Yeah, so, it, so if it winds up being out of cycle, then you, you have to correct. pay some kind of an early refresh fee. That's correct. But it can be done. I think we have another question from Goddard. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So the other questions, in view of the new agreement with HPNLM, do you plan to change your communication approach so that you can manage customer expectation, given the fact that we've been giving them different information? To the process. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll take that. Um, we we certainly do. Uh, right now, I, I uh, as as I said earlier, we're um, working together, NASA and, and HP, on what the uh, the the refresh and deployment schedule will be. Um, you know, how soon and how long uh, it's going to take. And as as soon as we reach agreement on that, we're going to get that out out to folks. But um, you know, until we, you know, have something definite to say, um, I think we're, we're just better off not saying anything other than, you know, come November 1st, out of Goddard, you're a Wave 1 center, you know, folks are going to continue to, to uh, utilize the uh, equipment that they have, uh, the Odin equipment, which has been bought by HP, and HP will, will be providing that service. Um, and as soon as we, uh, we have good information to get out, uh, Jean-Marie, we will get that out to you guys. Okay. We have two questions coming in from Langley. Go ahead, Langley. Uh, yes. I was wondering if none of the machines listed actually meet your specific software requirements. What are your options? Um, gee, so Rob, you want to take that? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, John. All right. So if, if the S... The standard premium seat, the modified, which is just a little variation of that one where let's say you want it to our return to service, that's a, a modifiable seat. Or if the T seat, which is a thin client, or the build seat, which you can build the type of machine that you want, if none of those work for you, then there's also the X build. And it's not a seat, but it's an ability for you to go out and get a, a computer uh, you know, uh, a computer that, that you want to get. Uh, maybe there's something brand new out on the market that does exactly, has all the specs for exactly what you want to do on some of your research or, or some of those kind of things that you're, you're doing for your, your job. Um, the X build, not a seat, uh, gives you that ability. You can go out and just uh, purchase that. Uh, now, when you do that, you got you also remember there's a sysadmin that needs to go with it. So the contract also has that ability. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're buying 100 of those or 200 of those, then it makes a lot of sense to get a sysadmin support to be able to make sure you're doing all the patching and uh, keeping the security settings up. Uh, you know, if you're buying one, that makes it a little more difficult. It still has to fall under some security plan to make sure that it gets its updates and it's following all the standards. I think there's another question from Langley. I've actually got two sorts of unrelated questions. The first is uh, I know that there's a lot of infrastructure that's required to go along with the thin client seats, and it'll be a while before that comes in, but when can we actually start seeing thin client machines on the field? And then my second question is um, now with the new NICS contract, are we going to have any chance of getting upgraded performance between centers because we regularly send 
very large files off to NAS that can take a day or two to transfer and then have to get them back. And it would be really nice if we had a bit more performance going out there. Thank you. So okay. let me take the first one. The uh, T seat, the thin client seat, which is just a, uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's just a, a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard, and a network appliance where it goes back to a server. It's being worked right now. It, um, they're, they're, the HP folks are working very hard on it. We have an a, a IPT set up, an in, in, in a integrated process team that is working to get that on, on board. I know that there's been a lot of work on it so far, but it's not ready as, as you indicated. Um, I got uh, Noel Salvanero here in the audience, and uh, I think it might be a good idea to just get a, a quick update on where we are with the TC. Thank you. Um, as John indicated, we are still certifying the infrastructure and also um, performing the necessary testing for uh, compliance with the security plan, and we anticipate that the T-seats will be available um, for order. They're available for order now and that we'll be seeing those uh, deploying into the field um, in the November time frame. Thanks, Noel. Yeah, so the second part of the question, um, Tom, I, I don't know if uh, you can address, you know, any work that's uh, planned or in progress on uh, the, the network side and, and uh, especially the transfer of data between centers. Sure. Um, we don't have any plan. I mean, as we transition uh, each of the centers and the WAN, which already has been transferred over to NICS, um, uh, we're, we're taking over the assets in place, so the same capabilities that are there. Um, what I can tell you, though, is when you start talking about transfer between centers and, and, and having difficulty or needing some additional support, um, keep in mind now that NICS will be, will be um, running the network from end to end. So from endpoint to endpoint, through the LANs, through the firewalls, and through all the WAN, infrastructure, you have a single contractor now that is responsible for that end-to-end -end data flow. And so for specific instances where we need, um, where we need more capability to get that done, um, we, can go, we can go straight to SAIC um, with a, with a, or, or have them to write up a proposal, how much, what would it take to go do that to provide that end-to-end that -end, uh, connectivity. And I think it's going to be much improved from what we've had in the past, where we had to go to, to a LAN, two, two different LANs, maybe two different firewall um, vendors as well as the WAN. Uh, so I think, uh, I think in the future it would be much easier to, to make that happen. And I think built into the next contract is some innovation um, capability or, or uh, service, right? And, and so this might be an area where, um, you know, we utilize that, um, I don't know whether it's dollars or effort or, or how that's structured, but anyhow, I mean, we could, we could point folks to these types of problems and, and they could come up with right. and solutions. Good, and Gary's right, it, it was uh, specifically built into the contract for constant innovation uh, on the network side from, uh, from the vendor and, and as well as on the civil servant side, working hand in hand with the vendor uh, to evolve the network and, and to, to make sure that we are really meeting the needs uh, of the customers now and, and in the future. Um, so yeah, we're, we want to keep tied into that and make sure that we, uh, that we do that. Yeah, I mean, what's, what's important to note is, as you said, SAIC is going to be coming in and taking the environment over, you know, as it is, and then, you know, progressively be going through and, and looking at the choke points and, and figuring out ways to, uh, to improve the network to, to meet the mission requirements. Right. Okay, I think we have a question coming in from Glenn. Is there a planned deployment of the Office Suite 2010 so that everyone is working on the same level of Office and uh, also IE to the latest version? The reason I ask is because I have a project that has dependencies on Project Professional 2010. Yeah, John, can you, can sure. you address that? So Office 2010 is, is going to be on the, uh, the new build. Um, you asked about the latest IE. Um, and, and what that takes a, a lot of testing, and IE and, and all the other browsers change so frequently or have upgrades so frequently that, that, it, that we're always lagging a little bit behind on the testing because, you know, we do want to get it in and, and do some good testing with all the different apps that we have out there, make sure that it works. Um, we've had to slow down on a few, um, a few of the upgrades in the past because, uh, it, you know, there's been some incompatibility with some of our apps, and the apps needed to catch up. And so all that's been uh, 
actually working pretty good. Uh, Will, you have the absolute latest of the IE um, as of uh, tomorrow or, or as of November 1st? Um, no, we were usually one, one back. And, uh, you know, I, I'm starting to see some of the, uh, like Firefox and others that are, they're, they're changing uh, every, every three months. So, you know, we're, we're really struggling to keep up with that um, and do the testing. So, so in this case, we have uh, the gold build, which will be deployed on all of the new seats. Uh, and that in, that's uh, in concert with the NASA standard 2804, right? So that's the Office uh, 2010. Uh, and then uh, Internet Explorer, I, th I think, is, uh, I guess the gold build has uh, version 7 right now? Yeah. Or is it, it 8? It's 8, version okay. 8 right now. 9 is, is out too, but we're still doing some testing. Okay. So th that's what will be deployed now. Of course, we have, you know, a lot of... Uh, existing seats that don't have, uh, you know, that level of, of software. So uh, it's going to take us a little while to, to get to the point where everybody is on uh, this, the same well, the same operating system, same office suite, et cetera. That's true. Jerry, can I add, uh, I mean, part of the, the, the dilemma we face is, is that we're kind of uh, having to mediate with also our commercial off-the-shelf vendors uh, where we, you know, we're, we've gone to a, a COTS model for our enterprise applications. We don't develop our own like we used to uh, in, the, in the mainframe days. So we're uh, watching the, the, uh, uh, the Firefox and the Internet Explorers, as John said, they're more agile than they used to be. They're moving uh, more quickly. They're out trying to outflank each other. On the other side of that spectrum, we've got our commercial off-the-shelf vendors, SAPs, CompuSearches, others, uh, Fed Travelers, that we're trying to bring along as well, so it's it's a real dilemma, and especially as the as the uh, uh, as the as the speed, the throughput on these uh, browser versions have, has been picking up as of late. It's tougher for us to to make sure that we keep the group together, keep the enterprise applications together, and inter interoperable with each other. So I will say to, to 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 reinforce what John said, it's becoming a tougher job, and especially when the users want to proceed uh, more quickly as well. So just, just to kind of let you know what's going on behind the scenes and trying to make this all work together and try to be more responsive is in the same time is a tough one. Yeah, and, and the, uh, the, the folks out at Glenn actually are, are pretty uh, heavily involved in, in helping us with some of that testing, the uh, ETADS, Emerging Technology and Desktop Standards, Desktop Standards Group, uh, led by Tony <laughs> Faka. Um, I think they, they do a good job of trying to balance out you know, how fast we move versus, you know, what it breaks uh, when we get there. And, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not <clears throat> simple. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a delicate dance that we've been doing for several years now. We update our standards twice a year. And, it, and just of late, I'm having to even do them every three months. Uh, I can't wait six months to get the next standard out, unfortunately, with how quick everything's moving. Okay, I think we have another question coming from JSC. Okay, thank you. With the changes to NICS from Odin, how does the local area network manage and charge for ads or moves? Was LAN A, B, et cetera under Odin? What is it now? Yeah, this is uh, actually a great, great question for Tom or some of his support team here. Can't, can't John answer this question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that, that is a good question, and I know Gary touched on it before about the nomenclature, and, and yes, JSC being an Odin Center, um, we did have NADs and LAN A's and LAN B's and LAN C's. Uh, with NICS, uh, because we're managing it more as, a, as an agency infrastructure, um, you'll order a network seat, and, and that's actually not a seat but a network drop. Um, and, and whatever you have connected to it, it's a single network drop, it's a single order uh, service that you would order. Um, so that's getting kind of pared down all to one single, one single service. Um, you also won't see a charge for, uh, on that particular item for, for putting in a new drop or even moving a drop from one place to another. Um, that's built in sort of the base uh, of, for, that each center is paying for, for their NIC services overall. So it's kind of a single bill for the center for network services for the year. Um, for, for moves up to a certain point, that's certainly covered. Uh, for large moves, uh, we would again uh, go through an IUP similar to what we would do with Odin. Um, 
and again, we would look to see where that where that falls into uh, what the what the center has already projected for the year and, and for NIC services. Um, and so that's so it's simplified quite a bit um, from what we had been before. Yeah, yeah, and that's a case where you know SAIC is going to have a presence at JSC. You know, they're they're there to you know install network connections and and fix things. And as long as they don't have to go out and hire somebody else to do this, it's just no additional charge. Now, you know, if they have to, to come in and, and stand up a whole new infrastructure of switches and routers, et cetera, to get out there, then, you know, we'll have to, we'll get a price for that and we'll have to work that through the, uh, you know, a build process. But uh, normal things that you're used to doing under Odin, I, I think, are just going to be part of the center charges for network services. Okay, Gary, I think we have a question from Stennis. I, I believe that's it then, I'm sorry. Uh, all of the centers going once? Twice? I think we're sold, everybody. Okay. Well, uh, Gary, would you like to add any uh, closing remarks? Well, again, I, I want to thank, uh, you know, folks for attending here at headquarters. It's, it's encouraging to see that people actually show up for work on Fridays. Uh, we had uh, some concern about doing it, whether uh, there, there would be folks, but I'm, I'm glad to see that there was a good turnout. I know that there's going to be a, uh, a follow-on event here, and I hope uh, the same is true at many of the other centers for you to get specifics about your particular center and, and location. And I certainly want to thank the, uh, you know, my team here and, and the, our vendor partners for, for showing up and, and supporting us. And, um, you know, by all means, go to our website, uh, you know, for any questions that you, you have or, or call me direct. Um, we'll, we'll find an answer. Okay. Thanks, Eldora. You're welcome. Um, I think we can put up our, our website in case you don't know it. Um, it is inside NASA at, dot, excuse me, inside nasa.nasa.gov slash OCIO slash I3P. Also, um, we do have a mailbox that we have set up. It's called askI3P at nasa.gov, and uh, your questions and answers will be displayed on our website. If you have any coworkers who missed today's event, we will have a recorded version available on Monday, so you can check our website for that. Um, several of the centers are having some follow-on discussions, so uh, please stay tuned for that. That concludes our event here at NASA headquarters. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's event. Have a great day.